Hi, welcome to Dairy Community Television. My name is Suzanne Bernier Robinson. Today's show is going to be about the Dairy History Museum, located at 29 West Broadway here in Derry in the Adams Memorial Building. This is a real treat today to have the opportunity to talk with Rick Holmes, our town historian for Derry. Rick, were you born here in Derry? Yeah, I was born here up on East Derry Hill on the old Alexander Eastman, a big old wooden farmhouse that was given by the Hood family to the town as our first hospital. And that's where I came from and uh, haven't moved very far since. So you've always lived here in Derry? Um, not yet. So I guess that gives you some credentials to be the town historian. Yeah, and, and the fact that I love the town and, and have all my degrees in history, I guess, give me a good reason once I retired to fill up my shining hours with being the town historian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I appreciate the fact that um, the town asked me to uh, function in this role about, about two years ago, because I was uh, chairman of the Heritage Commission for about 30 years. And uh, then I got off, needed a couple years to finish some other projects, and then Ed Garone came to my house and said, uh, Rick, how can we get you back in the town? And uh, this is how this position was created. And uh, Denise Neal, the um, town clerk, offered me this space, and uh, here I am, um, uh, twice a week and as many hours as people want me. Do you have set hours in case someone wanted to come by? I'm definitely here on Monday mornings from 8 to noon, and then on Wednesday afternoon from uh, 4 to 7. And if anyone wants to come in some other hour, just a matter of calling me, my uh, number's on the town website. And uh, if my wife hasn't got chores for me, then I'll be down. <laughs> That's wonderful. So what is the role of the town historian? Well, I'm, I'm the professional know-it-all. Uh, by being here in the town hall, there's a lot of walk-through traffic. Mm -hmm. And people just come up with a question. I always wanted to ask about this or that. Or they come in to ask about their house, who used to live there, or their family's genealogy. And so every time when I'm here, I bring about 70 pounds of books, and I can answer most of their questions. And if I don't know the answer, I just make up one, and they, they walk. No, oh, no, I no. know you don't do that. <laughs> no. Plus, I have my computer here, and so with looking at a house, we can go back to the original deed. You know, if the, if the deed was in 1740, we can go online and actually see that deed. And uh, we have Ancestry.com, so I can work a little bit with genealogy. I have, uh, again, all of those books, the uh, town reports, the registries for the town. Plus, we have about 10 or 15 maps here in the room. Uh, the earliest map we have here um, goes back to 1736. And uh, we have maps which show the location of every house with every house's name going back to the... Um, 1830s. Wow. And I also understand you have some glass slides of a lot of homes and uh, activities that may have gone on. All right. In my, in my computer here, I have hundreds of photographs, you know, going back from the Civil War period right up to the present. So I can usually help most people who come through. And if I can't, I will tell them, come back next week. I'll have it written up for you. And, and if I remember, you're, you were a teacher, is that right? Yeah, I taught for 32 years. I, I taught my uh, 12 and 13 year olds, and I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And then I had a chance to retire with some degree of dignity. Mm -hmm. And um, this has been my function ever since then. And I'm, I'm now working on my seventh book. Now that's one of the nice things about this office. It's a quiet place, and when somebody is not here, I can be working on my articles for, for the newspapers and so forth. Like right over here, turning over here, I'm, I'm working on a whole bunch of different articles. Oh, and you're still writing them by hand, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have to take my notes. Uh, this one, this whole folder is on a dairy man who in 1933 set the world record, or at least his hens did, for the most eggs in a year. His hens did, so he actually kept count of how many eggs. Right. Uh, his hens, one hen laid 335 eggs in one year. 
Wow, she didn't obviously molt. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and wow. He was using genetic engineering, and he was able to have hens that were laying eggs 12 years. So incredible egg production. Wow, that sounds interesting. He was shipping his eggs all over the world, to Peru, to South America, to uh, South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also working on, on, the, on Pinkerton Academy's plaque, the one by the front door. And let me see, oh yeah. I, I work on a bunch of articles all at the same time and go from one to the other when I find information. Here I am working on, on the biography of Samuel Prescott. Anytime we eat food today, you thank Samuel Prescott. He's the one who developed all the formulas for preserving and cooking food. You know, for everything from Drake's can uh, cakes to uh, spaghetti in a can, really? all by his formulas. Mm -hmm. And these, so these are things and people that were right here right in Derry that Derry. you write about. You know, mm -hmm. Some of them I, I knew, like, like Dr. Prescott. And, uh, and when he developed these formulas for food, mm -hmm. he refused to have any royalties. Really? He just gave it to the American public because um, he started to develop these after the Spanish-American War mm -hmm. when we lost more soldiers by food poisoning mm -hmm. than by bullets. Mm -hmm. So he knew that couldn't continue. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he worked very hard. And I, I just keep on going from one folder to the next folder. Um, I'm working on articles on World War I, and so it's a good life. Plus, by being here, people walk by and say, you know, I have something I've always wanted to give to the town. Oh, wow. That's a real treat. Oh, yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, somebody brought in an ox yoke, okay. which is now going to be at the uh, frost farm. Mm -hmm. um, I have a wonderful quilt that was made in Derry in the 1880s. And it has pictures on all the squares. There's, there's a hun 120 squares. That are quilted, the pictures are quilted. Right, and every one shows a different scene. Some old people on horseback, mm -hmm. and it's dated by the person who did it, or by a bunch of ladies who did it. Mm -hmm. And so by being here, this was a spot they know they could come and give these things. You know, we get books and documents and so forth and pictures. People come because we're here and it's easy to find here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. And you're accessible and you have such a passion for doing that research and finding out all the details. Um, your articles are wonderful in the paper. You've got uh, set, how many books on dairy? I, I'm uh, working on my seventh book now. And they're all about dairy. Uh, for the most part, of this area anyways, yeah. And um, I just love doing it, and I've got a very understanding wife. Y you know, um, earlier this, or last month now, uh, we went on our trip to uh, Northern Ireland to unveil that plaque in Agadui mm -hmm. because the government of Northern Ireland was honoring the founder of Derry with a plaque. Mm -hmm. you know, the Derry, Ireland. Well, yeah. Well, the founder of Derry, New Hampshire. Derry. New Hampshire came from the little town of Agadui in Northern Ireland. Oh, I was thinking there was a Derry. Oh, there is. There is a Derry, Ireland. Right. Too. Okay. Derry, Northern Ireland. Derry, Northern Ireland. So the government of Northern Ireland was putting up a plaque in, in, in Agadui, Northern Ireland, in honor of the founder of our Derry, Derry New Hampshire, and London Derry. That's interesting. So I was invited to go over there for the unveiling, mm -hmm. and... Um, give a speech and so forth. And that's a thrill to be able to represent our town mm -hmm. in a foreign country. And because um, being town historian is a very expensive little hobby. Well, I can't imagine any budget associated with it. So yes, I'm sure it is. Yeah, my budget is zero. <laughs> yes, I, that's what I would expect. Yeah, and my travel allowance is zero. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, my wife is very understandable. Well, the appreciation for the citizens, I will speak, is is 100%. I mean, there's so much interest. And the, the teacher, I mentioned you being a teacher, just the way that you talk to uh, some of the students and classes that you've gone on and, and gone into as a speaker. Um, and at the library, your presentations are just presented in such a way they're captivating that I think I could listen to you all day. Well, once upon a time, I had about 125 students per year. Now I have about 34,000. Mm -hmm. 
and, and and what I get back is a thousand times more than what I give. It's just I, I I'm over the moon being the town historian. Well, that is a great way to end. Thank you for your time today. All right. I hope you've really enjoyed learning about Derry's town historian. There is so much information about Derry um, in this man right here. He's such a wealth of knowledge, and he's very entertaining and enjoyable to listen to. So definitely stop by the Municipal Center is where his office is. It's on the first floor as you walk in from the back parking lot. And if he is not here, information is on the town's website on how to contact him. I hope you'll stop by and visit him. Well, please, won't you come down, hit, stay us here, and visit the Dairy Museum. We're very proud of it. Okay, welcome to the Dairy Museum. This is the entranceway, and this is where I have the Cub Scouts and the school groups sit while I tell them about the museum. Over on the wall, we have some very large photographs that were taken in 1938 at Beaver Lake, and they were taken by the Hood Milk Company and used as an exhibit at the Eastern States Exposition because the Hoods wanted to pay tribute to the town where they were founded. So if you come this way, we can go into the museum and just walk by everything that's just stuck on the walls right now to give you a sense of the history of the town and this building. And here we have the entrance to the museum. And what I've tried to do here is to show the history of the town, the first settlers, the Native Americans. And here I have some of the Indian artifacts that would have been from around this area. But I also throw in some of the artifacts from other Indian cultures to show that the Native Americans were not just one monolithic culture. There was all kinds of different Indian tribes and different cultures and ways of living. And the people we had around here were the people who used the Stone Age tools. Up on the wall, I have a drawing made of Passer Conway. And he was the person who actually was the chief, the sachem of the Indians who sold this land. And we got this land fair and square from the Native Americans. We didn't steal it, we didn't take it, we didn't fight for it. We actually bought it from somebody who bought it from Passa Conway. On the other side, I do the history of the white people coming here. Our people came from Scotland to Northern Ireland, and then in 1718, they came over here. And I have some of the relics from those original settlers, uh, led by the McGregor, James McGregor, who was the pastor of their church over in Agadui in Northern Ireland. And we're very proud of our connection to Northern Ireland. In fact, James McGregor is called the Moses of the Scotch-Irish in America. And this is a sermon by his son, and this cane was actually made of a piece of James McGregor's house. Now the house itself was torn down in 1863, but people realized that that was really a strong piece of our history. So there was a number of pieces of wood that were sold and stole our hand saved, and this one here was made into a cane. And it has a little plaque identifying it. This door came from James McGregor's church, and over here we have James McGregor's uh, gravestone. Of course, Derry is also the birthplace of the potato in North America, and so we have pictures from the potato monument and uh, other things of the uh, spud. Some of our early mills are shown. Now, this fireplace is very interesting. This was the fireplace in our first post office. This goes back to about the 1791. And I bought that off Alan Shepard, the astronaut, because Alan Shepard's grandfather tore down that building, but they saved that mantle, that surround. 
and every year at Christmas when Alan was a little boy they would bring out that mantle and put it in the living room and hang stockings from it. So that's the mantle that Alan Shepard grew up with and then I purchased it from him a number of years ago. Over on top we have a picture of, of John Stock who was born here in town and he of course is remembered for his toast that is on the license plate, live free or die. On the other side we have Robert Rogers, another soldier from the French and Indian War. In fact, Robert Rogers taught John Stark how to fight. But during the Revolutionary War, Robert Rogers went with the British and because John Stark went with the Patriot cause. Ice cutting linen. Now linen was the first industry we had here in Derry. Our linen was so good, in 1741, the state of New Hampshire ordered that all of the linen made in Derry be stamped, burnt, with a big L for Londonderry on it. And so that was the first trademarked product in America because other towns were making linen and claiming it, claim it came from us, but was never as good as ours. People like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson wore cloth were shirts and coats made from our linen. It was that good. And so these are things, and that's actually a piece of the linen that was made here in town. And this little model of a wheel, that's the model from the Taylor Mill. Before they made the water wheel there, they made this little, little prototype to see how well it worked. And that's that. So we have a lot of things from the mill era, and over here, of course, our most famous farmer, and that was H.P. Hood. He started his milk production here in Derry because of the railroad trains. He could make his butter here on Broadway and be in Boston 60 minutes later. So because of Derry being a transportation hub, H.P. started his uh, milk industry here, which is still the largest in New England. On the wall, we have a dugout canoe that came from the bottom of Beaver Lake. Oh, a bunch of years ago, about 20 years ago, two locals had lost the sail on their sailboat and they got some scuba diving outfits and went to the bottom of Beaver Lake looking for their sail. And then they found that and walked it to shore. Took about a year to dry it out by slowly drying it out. And so they gave it to the museum. So we're one of six museums in the state that have dugout canoes that were found here in, uh, in New Hampshire. The one in the Milliard Museum in Manchester that one came from Londonderry. Over here we have some of the trolley things. Like that's the power switch that made the trolley move. The conductor, the engineer just needed to turn that knob, that brass handle, and it would go forward, put it backwards, and it would stop. That's all the power you had on a trolley. You didn't have no brakes or anything like that. And that's another thing that I bought off Alan Shepard. Over here we have the actual trolley bell. And we have another exhibit over here of H.P. Hood and one of his uniforms. This is a great picture here. There's H.P. Hood sitting in the milk car, uh, railroad car and there's his three sons there. So the farmers would bring the milk to Derry Depot, HP would sit inside the car, he would write down how much each milk producer gave him. When it's filled, they would close the doors, he would go down to Boston riding in that milk car. In Boston, he'd sell the milk right from the railroad car. 
without getting out, and then the car would go back to Derry for another load, with him sitting inside figuring out his receipts. So that's the very start of the H.P. Hood Milk Company, the Dairy Company. Up top there you have a picture of the H.P. Hood Farm, which is now Chin's Restaurant, down by the Dairy Traffic Circle. Okay. That light is beginning to go, isn't it? And I'm afraid you can't even get in there, can you? No, I get it. I you get, get it. it. Here is a model, a scale model of the, of the depot on Broadway back when it was a functioning railroad depot. And that lantern over there with the red inside, that belonged to the station master. Um, Hercules Papacristos very generously gave that to us and it's engraved on the globe with the name of the, of the uh, depot master. Over here we have more scenes, hotels that function because of the railroad station. This is the last telegraph key used in Derry at the railroad station. And of course all this came to a roaring halt when automobiles came into the picture and this would be the sound you would hear as you were trying to cross the road in Derry. <coughs> the Auga, the Claxton Horn, from a, a Model T. Derry became very big, very popular, a lot of traffic. And so many people were doing their shopping. Like my mother would do all of her shopping right on Broadway. At the A&P, the First National Store, the three drug stores. And we started to have, to have parking meters in Derry starting in the 1940s because there was just so much traffic of shoppers coming to downtown Derry to do their shopping that we had to regulate traffic. So we have one parking meter still left. And the parking meter was, was wonderful because you, it would take dimes and pennies and that was about as much as you wanted. Uh, a dime would give you an hour. And when local charities started to collect money, like for the March of Dime, if you put your dime into that with some red paint on it, it, the town would give it to the March of Dimes. So it was almost like a collection agency for the charities. Here we have the account book from the London Dairy Turnpike. Now that's the road which now is 28 and 28 bypass. Before that, the main part of Derry was up there on the hill in East Derry. But when they built the London Derry Turnpike, which opened in 1906, now all the traffic went down to the lower village, to Derry Village. And so that's the, that's the account book. And there's a share of stock, because the London Derry Turnpike, 2828 bypass, was built by private money. And it was a toll road. Between here and Concord, there was about four toll gates that you had to pay your money in order to use that road. Because most roads at that time were hilly and rocky and muddy. The Londonderry Turnpike was fairly smooth and, and fairly rock free. So everybody would use that, but a lot of people figured out how to go around the toll gates. And so as a result, after about 20 years, the the Londonderry Turnpike Corporation just went broke and um, now it became a public road. Here we can see one of the jail cells from the original jail that was here in this building up until uh, the 1980 when they built the new bias, uh, when they built the new police station over on Ross's corner. We used to have three jail cells here, all made of that steel plates. We have exhibit over here at Pinkerton. A lot of Pinkerton memorabilia. Actually some things from, from the Pinkerton brothers who founded the school. This, like a Wheaties box, because Trish Dunn, who went to Pinkerton, is on there. We have photographs going back to the very beginning. And this is our collection of postcards. 
in these folders, we have about 1,200 different postcards from Derry, all from about 1,900 up to fairly close to the present. So it's a huge collection, and um, it really gives us a chance to see what the town looked like by looking at these postcards. And sometimes people would hire somebody to take a picture of their house or their backyard, and there may be only one or two copies of these postcards. So sometimes these postcards we have are the only ones that exist. Want to take a picture of that? This was the first automobile in Derry. This was about 1900, and the Alexander twins, they owned this car. It was a steamer. Now, the Alexander twins were both dentists, and they were celebrity dentists. They had their office in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Madrid, Spain, and they'd go back and forth between the two offices. They were the dentists to the king of Portugal, the king of Spain, the richest people in Europe went to the Alexander brothers for their dental work. Uh, they crossed the Atlantic every time, multiple times every year. And uh, when they went on vacation, they would vacation in uh, China or Japan or Australia or the Caribbean. And they were the only ones in town who really had real money. And so that's probably why they had the first car in Derry. In fact, Robert Frost even makes reference to them in one of his letters saying how the king of Portugal was so poor he had to have Dr. Alexander scrape some of the gold from his crown in order to make a set of fillings, gold fillings for his uh, mouth. Over here we have an exhibit of things from the Adams Female Academy. The Adams Female Academy was the first girls school in America that taught girls the same as boys, that had an endowment, that actually issued diplomas. All over the country, people were talking about this experiment called the Adams Female Academy. That's why Lafayette came to Derry in 1825, because he had heard that there was a school. The girls were taught just like boys, so he wanted to visit that school. And when he came there, he talked to all the girls, and then he kissed every girl's hand as a lift. And his parting words were, farewell forever. And Lafayette left. But he came to visit the Adams Female Academy. And the reason it was so famous was because its chief teacher was Mary Lyon. Now she left the Adams Female Academy and founded Mount Holyoke College, which was the first woman's college. And so if you go on to the American Hall of Fame, the Women's Hall of Fame, the American Educators Hall of Fame, they all have a statue of Mary Lyon there. And a lot of schools have a Mary Lyon Hall in honor of Mary Lyon, the pioneer of American female education. Quite a lady. And the government, of course, issued a stamp in honor of Mary Lyons a few years ago. Now, when I was examining this diploma from the Adams Female Academy, I had to use a really severe magnifying glass to try to read what it said on the embossed seal. And finally, I came, after piecing it together, probably worked three or four hours, doing each letter one at a time, I found that it said, drink deep or taste not. Well, I thought that was very strange. I couldn't understand why anyone would put that onto a girl's school diploma. And so then I did a Google search. Then I suddenly hit my forehead with my hand saying, oh, of course I know where it comes from because everybody knows the next line. It's from Alexander Pope. The line that came right before it is, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Parian Spring. In other words, if you're going to learn something, don't just learn it superficially. Learn it. Learn the whole thing. Drink deep or taste not.
which is a great bottle for a school. Okay. Okay, in the 19... Say again, Holmes. Ready? You ready? In the 1870s, the shoe industry came to Derry. And uh, Colonel Pillsbury, William Pillsbury, started a shoe factory here, a small one, and then it grew and grew and grew. And by World War I, if you were living in Derry, about two-thirds of our men and women were working in the shoe industry. And those who weren't were probably working in something that was supporting the workers like the stores or the churches or the halls. So Derry was actually a one-occupation town. And that really hurt us because during the Great Depression, all of our shoe factories just closed at one time. So we probably had the highest unemployment of any town in the state of New Hampshire. We were over one-third unemployed. And so you just couldn't buy a job in Derry because of the, there was no job. The shoe factories had closed. And all over here we have different... The Derry shoe was the last big one. And these are all the equipment that came from... And every year the shoe companies would take their employees for a picnic. And they'd go to Canopy Lake or some place in Massachusetts and have one day in which they could, didn't have to work. And then they went back to work. And when Robert Frost was here, the shoe factories were going fast as they could go. There was one shoe factory that was built in 1905 on South Avenue. That was the biggest fa wooden factory in the world. It was 425 feet long, four stories, two sub-basements. That was the dairy shoe. Now all the shoe factories are gone. In fact, the last cobbler in dairy closed a couple years ago. And before, I, before he left, I talked him into giving me some of his shoe equipment. And the town actually had to use a crane in order to get this in. And so that cobbler set it up exactly like he would be using it. In fact, this was the glue pot that he used. And you can see 20, 30 years of glue spilling down the side in this glue pot. That's the history of shoemaking in Derry. And it ended with this piece of equipment. When I started to work in Derry, all, all the uh, workers, be it in the factories or the stores, always carried a lunch pail. I carried that lunch pail for many years when I was working at the Benjamin Chase Company. And um, Ma would put a banana or a sandwich or whatever on Monday mornings, it would be a bean sandwich from Saturday night bean supper. But um, when you think of the dairy workers, these sh this is this is a tobacco tin made into a lunch box. Kids would go to school carrying their lunch pails. Now this was very much of a working thing, and it's now forgotten. Derry used to be a summer resort town. If you had real money, of course, you had a mansion at Newport. If you had kind of some money, you might go to one of the grand hotels upstate New Hampshire, in the White Mountains. If you were lower middle class, you vacationed in Derry. Farmers turned their big farmhouses into summer resorts. There was probably a dozen farmhouses in Derry that offered rooms during the summer for people from Boston or Philadelphia. They'd come up here by train and trolley. The wife and the kids would spend all week in our farmhouses going for hay rides or fishing in Beaver Lake. And then the husbands would join them on weekends. And when you went back to Philadelphia or Boston, you'd want a souvenir to show that you were rich enough to rusticate in the piney woods of Derry. And so you'd buy one of these souvenirs. 
showing different scenes of our beautiful town. And we have about 150 different dairy souvenirs, but we also tossed in some of our other things that uh, the bottles that are made here in Derry, uh, witch hazel or whiskey or different souvenirs. Over here, Forest Hill Cemetery. Now, Derry is unusual in the fact that we only have one public cemetery in Derry. Most towns have multiple. And at Forest Hill Cemetery is a grave for Alan Shepard, for H.P. Hood, some of the heroes of the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, a lot of Civil War veterans. I consider it one of the greatest cemeteries in New Hampshire because it has a great variety of gravestones going back to 1722. Great sports hero, uh, George Lefty Tyler, he went to Pinkerton and he played for the Boston Braves and so he pitched for the Boston Braves in the World Series of 1914. They're called the Miracle Braves because on 4th of July they were on last place. And then their playing didn't improve, but their pitching did. And he was part of a three-pitcher rotation. And by the end of the regular season, they won, and they won the pennant in four straight games, and then went on to win the World Series. They were the first team to win it in four straight games with George Lefty Tyler pitching. Afterwards, he played for the Chicago um, Cubs, and he pitched in the 1918 World Series. So he was quite a player. And here is a loving cup and a ball from George Lefty Tyler. This picture up here shows all the people, a lot of the people from Derry, going down to Brave Stadium to watch George Lefty Tyler pitch in a game in 1913. In those days, when you went to a ball game, you wore a suit and tie, and the ladies wore long dresses and hats. Now, this is one thing we're, we're really proud of. This is called the Badge of Honor. This is the oldest piece of fire equipment in the town of Derry. In the 1830s, the town bought this. Whoever was holding this at a fire was in charge. He was the person who told everybody where to throw the water from the bucket brigade, where to smash that wall down to stop the fire. And if you didn't obey the man who was holding on to this, it was a $50 fine. And that's about as much as a person would earn in two months. So this was the badge of honor. And if you had that, you better obey him. Over here, we have a lot of things from Pam Smart, a lot of books in honor of Pam Smart, or at least talking about Pam Smart. I'm not sure they're in honor of her. Um, these are all different things like Here's a copy of that movie, To Die For, with Nicole Kidman and Murder in New Hampshire, starring Helen Hunt, various books on her, Teach Me to Kill, bumper sticker saying, I'm a friend of Pam Smart. I'm not sure who would have that on their car, but... And these are all from our fire equipment, the red phone, Members of the volunteer fire department would have one of these in their house, and when a fire call went out, you'd get a call on your red phone. Imagine those days when you could be sent to jail for spitting. And they were put up by the railroad, because back in those days, people were chewing a lot of tobacco and expectorating on the floor of the uh, railroad station and it was afraid that spitting would pass tuberculosis around. So they made it a law, you could be thrown in jail for spitting. Now, there we have the original Alexander Eastman Hospital. Now that's where I was born. That was replaced in 1964 by the new Alexander Eastman Ho Hospital. That's where my kids were born. And that was replaced by Parkland and that's probably where I'll die. So there's kind of the story of my life, right, in three hospitals.
various bottles and so forth, medicines from dairy. The scale is not a baby scale. It came from a pool hall in dairy. And at, at the end of the night, they charge five cents per pool game. And that is set up so it will weigh the money. That much is $10 worth of nickels. That is $20 worth of nickels. Beats counting, I guess. Civil War doctor's kit from Derry. And another famous doctor who lived here was Dr. Sanders. He was the first doctor ever put on trial for mercy killing for euthanasia. Exactly 50 years before Dr. Kravakian, we had Dr. Sanders. And he was found innocent, even though he put in his medical notes exactly what he did to end the life of his patient who was suffering from bone cancer. And some of our social life, like the queen of the 1926 Winter Carnival. That's her address, and there's a picture of her over there. And there's the key to the Winter Carnival that, that she carried. Winter Carnivals were very big from the 1920s up until the 1950s, when we went two years without any snow and we got kind of discouraged. Over here we have the churches. Um, I try to get something from most every church, and that's the first sermon that was ever preached in Derry. In the 17th century, um, somebody came and preached a sermon here long before we were a town. Over here we have the first printing press, but you're not over here. That's okay. This is the first printing press of the Dairy News. And so you'd have the type here and then roll that across and out would come the page. Now that's the first issue of the Dairy News back in 1880. And this is the dummy. This is what Mr. Bartlett drew on paper planning for the first issue of the Dairy News. So uh, that's the first stages of the press, which is now what a 134 years old. All right, this room here is devoted just to the military of Derry. On the walls, we have uh, posters from World War II. We have things going back to the Civil War, to the Revolutionary War, right up to the present. We have collections of hats hanging down and original drawings autographs of signers of the Declaration of Independence. So it's a very crowded but very complete collection of Derry military history. So here we have our two selectmen, Matthew Thornton, who wrote this one. He signed the Declaration of Independence. And the selectman who took over while he was down in Philadelphia in 18, 1776 was Stephen Holland. And he turned out to be the biggest spy for the British during the Revolutionary War. So we two selectmen, and they went different directions during the Revolutionary War. So don't think of America in 1776 as being everybody who was just patriot. As many people were for the British as war for George Washington. And Derry was a good example how our two selectmen were on opposing sides. Of course, nobody knew they were on opposing sides until after Stephen Holland was finally arrested for being a spy. Here is a letter that one of our soldiers sent because he was an army chaplain and he was the first 
army chaplain to go into Dachau after it was liberated from the Germans. And so he used Wasson SS stationery to send back this letter. And the first responsibility he had when he went into Dachau was to have a funeral for 10,000 bodies. It's a very moving letter. And if you go on to the National Holocaust site on the web, there will be a long article by this dairy minister um, uh, whose name was uh, John Gaskell, who was a minister at First Parish Church before he went into the uh, service as a chaplain. Where we're going to have our World War I exhibit that's coming up. Right now, we just kind of filled it with a lot of things. Over here, we have more than we can ever imagine keeping in a collection of puppets. We had a lady from Derry who actually won the Emmy for puppeteering. She performed at the White House. She performed all over the world. She was uh, with Jim Henson. We have the original head from Oscar the Grouch that uh, she had made for Jim Henson for his movie, Follow That Bird. And right now we have an exhibit, just a few. We have hundreds and hundreds of her puppets. She passed away a few years ago. She was also into buka dancing. And so that is one of the outfits she wore when she did buka. And that's as much as I know about buka. And that post office with the chicken on it, that was the original Derry post office down here in West Derry. And that would be the postal front that Robert Frost would come and mail his poems through that. We're probably moving that to the Frost Museum as a relic of Robert Frost. Devoted just to Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard was, of course, America's first man in space, and then he became the fifth man to walk on the moon. Now you can see by the genealogy chart that his family has been involved with, with dairy for five generations, going back way before the Civil War. And I think today it's hard to imagine how famous Alan Shepard was back in 1961 when he went into space. Just incredible fame. These are just a few of the post stamps that are issued in honor of Alan Shepard. And there's at least twice that many that's out there. So probably 50 or 60 countries have issued Alan Shepard stamps. And we have a lot of things, plus we have an exhibit right now at the Municipal Center on Alan Shepard. And we have things like his gloves and, and his baby ring and uh, things from his boyhood. So we're very proud. We also have Sp Space Town t-shirts and we will be selling those at the Dairy Fest. The 1961 the legislature of New Hampshire proclaimed that Derry is officially Space Town USA, and that became our official model. And that same year, the selectmen of Derry declared that May 5th, every year, in perpetuity, will be Alan Shepard Day in Derry. Hasn't been for a while. Maybe we should start that again. Right here, we have Alan Shepard's family Bible going back to the 1750s with all the different names of all the shepherds that have ever lived in America. So this is very much of a, of a treasure, his family Bible. And over here, we have his personal copy of Lindbergh's book, We. Alan Shepard, when he was a boy, had Charles Lindbergh as his personal hero. And that was the book he read over and over and over again, which inspired him to learn to fly. That little charm there is a Charles Lindbergh medal. And that's what Alan kept in his pocket when he was six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, 
because he just loved and admired Charles Lindbergh so much. Um, so little miniature George Grosses was all over America in 1946, trying to get people to join the Marines, little cutouts. Is the championship coat from the Derry Little League when they won the the New Hampshire State Championship in 1959. And um, a few years ago, the surviving members of the team came here with their coach, Coach Burlingham, and they presented that coat to the museum. This is the little bucket they used to pass around at all the games to try to get some collection money so they could buy new balls or new bats or whatever. And there's still a few members of the 1959 team. Um, the coach usually goes to Veterans Day every year when the Lions have their, their uh, celebration. There we have a good picture of what downtown Derry looked like in 1895. And this is from where Exit 4 is today, looking right down on Broadway. Over here you can see the First Parish Church. Over here you can see Pinkerton Academy. Over here is St. Thomas Aquinas Church, the one that burned down in 1914. You can see shoe factories here. It's a great picture. Over here you can see Oscar the Grouch. And um, this really shows what Derry was like 120 some odd years ago. I hope you've enjoyed today's show about the Derry History Museum. Once again, my name is Suzanne Bernier-Robinson. Thank you for watching Derry Community Television.